Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed scholars and professors, it is a pleasure to be gathered here and talk about my experience in the explosive digital asset space and the NFT sector. For those new to NFTs and the crazy world of crypto, do not fear. I shall explain these terms shortly. My name is Benjamin. I am a 12-year-old schoolboy from London, fascinated by the world of cryptocurrencies. I started my tech journey at a very young age. I was about five years old when I began learning to program. My dad would come home from work, pull out his laptop and start coding, and me and my brother would sniff around to see what he was doing. Initially, it was just a bit of fun, but over the next few years, we started getting serious, a lot more serious. We now complete one programming exercise every day religiously, including on holiday. Earlier this year, I got sucked into the NFT craze and help with the open source and NFT community, I launched my own collection. The collection went viral, attracted the international press and made me a considerable sum of money. My dad now asks me for pocket money. More important than the money is the community that I have joined. I now have friends that are software developers, investors, traders, PR experts, and they are willing to help and support me in this journey. People like Ying Chow and Matt from Work in Fintech, who you will hear from later, have become good friends. Everything from business and career advice to pastoral support. I am excited to be working with Work in Fintech and exploring how we can scale out the opportunities that I am blessed with to other young people. A year ago, I was posting coding videos on YouTube that very few people watched. So as you can imagine, it's a bit of a shock to be now talking on stage at such a venue. They do say things move at lightning speed in crypto, so fasten your seatbelts. Enough about me. Let's start looking at today's agenda and jumping into the universe that I call home. The first three topics I want to cover take us to a time when I was not born. In 2008, a revolution was started by a small group of programmers with a keen interest in cryptography, mathematics, politics and philosophy. They are known as the cypherpunks. Chapters 1 to 3 will focus on the spark that lit the revolution, Bitcoin. It is important to start your crypto journey here with the original and most valuable blockchain. Chapter 4 will focus on the second largest cryptocurrency by market cap, Ethereum, and the critical role it plays in decentralised finance known as DeFi, NFTs and the next iteration of the internet known as Web3. In chapter 5 to 10, we will start digging into the NFT craze and look at two different case studies. I will also talk about my own collection, Weird Wells. And to finish, I will provide a glimpse into where this is heading. The metaverse is no longer science fiction. It is real. It is happening. And it has forced Mark Zuckerberg to pivot his entire company by rebranding his meta. Exciting stuff as we move towards the opportunity of discovering a new continent in a world where we thought continents had been discovered. This time, however, that continent is entirely digital. Bitcoin and the revolution for sound money. On the 31st October 2008, a developer adopting the name Satoshi Nakamoto published the Bitcoin white paper. Nakamoto proposed an electronic peer-to-peer -peer currency. This was not the first time electronic cash had been attempted. Nakamoto realised that the failure of previous digital currencies was due to their centralised aspect. This fatal flaw allowed them to be easily attacked by the lawmakers. 
The small eight-page paper outlined a decentralised monetary network using a distributed ledger known as a blockchain. In its simplest terms, a blockchain is a giant Excel spreadsheet that has all the transactions recorded on, recorded on it, operating 24 hours, 365 days, and most importantly, owned by no one. Nakamoto's motivation for developing an electronic currency is clear. He was trying to claw back control from the banks and put the power back into the hands of the common man. This was the era of the 2008 financial crisis and the mass bailout of failing banks. The Bitcoin source code confirms this by embedding the following headline from the Times into its code base. The Chancellor on the brink of second bailout for banks. The white paper was released on 31st October, the same day in 1517 that the priest and scholar Martin Luther nailed a piece of paper to the doors of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany, containing 95 revolutionary opinions that started the Protestant Reformation. Nakamoto was in no doubt. He was starting his own financial reformation. Bitcoin started trading in July 2010 for 8 cents per coin. The current price is around $60,000 per coin. The Bitcoin blockchain has never been hacked or compromised. Why blockchains matter? Without employing a blockchain, Nakamoto's Bitcoin would have never succeeded. Nakamoto correctly identified the two most important attributes for a decentralised currency. Number one, permissionless. Anyone can join the network. It does not matter who you are, what you believe or the nature of your transaction. From Oxford professors to your local dealer, everyone has the same rights and permissions. Number two, censorship resistant. No activity can be stopped or censored. Transactions are irreversible. Both ideas may seem abhorrent to Hillary Clinton and a financial system rooted in KYC. However, Bitcoiners believe financial freedom and the goal to separate money creation from state control is as important and noble as religious freedom and the separation of church and state. A recurring criticism against blockchains is the energy cost. Not all blockchains are energy hungry. Different chains support different protocols. Some use heavy calculations which consume lots of energy and others secure the network by staking coins which are vastly more energy efficient but rely on depositing coins. Most blockchains, including leading NFT platform Ethereum, are switching to a staking protocol. Bitcoin stands out as the only remaining chain on an energy-consuming protocol. The debate is far more complex than has been laid out. For example, Bitcoiners firmly believe that the energy cost is worth the price for creating true decentralised networks that promote financial freedom. Operating the internet costs lots of energy, but no one would question the trade-off. Jack Dorsey and Square have laid out a convincing case that states, Bitcoin is key to an abundant and clean energy future. They make the claim that, unlike other mining operations, Bitcoin mining is not tied to any specific location and this is a unique feature which could be used to encourage investment in renewable sources. With energy companies like Tesla recently taking out a Bitcoin position and El Salvador using one of its volcanoes to mine Bitcoin, this energy efficient Bitcoin future may come sooner than expected. Digital and scarce. In addition to introducing the world to blockchains, Nakamoto also introduced a completely novel concept that will play an important role going forward. Digital scarcity. Bitcoin was miraculously programmed 
with a fixed supply and a fixed issuance schedule. Unlike central banks determined to rescue their debt-ridden economies and print as much money as possible, Bitcoin's supply was capped at 21 million. The table on screen compares several properties of Bitcoin against gold and fiat. Let's look at a couple. As we can see, although gold is rated as A+, for having an established 5,000 year history, and newcomer Bitcoin as D, it fares poorly in many other areas. For example, portability, the ability to transmit billions of dollars of wealth down a telecommunications line at the speed of light, 24-7. Bitcoin now ranks as A+, and gold with expensive storage and transportation costs as D. The visibility. The feature to instantly divide Bitcoin into smaller units and also program digital applications on top of its ecosystem is completely unique and fertile with endless opportunities. Scarcity. Although gold is scarce, Bitcoin is scarcer. Fiat money ranks very poorly here as central bank money printers have completely drained it from any scarce attribute. The chart on screen shows how Bitcoin's issuance schedule changes over time, making it even scarcer. An initial block reward bringing 50 new Bitcoins into existence reduces to 6.25 Bitcoins by 2020. It doesn't stop here. By the year 2140, the final Bitcoin will be incrementally minted over a period of 40 years. This is absolutely mind-blowing. Think about that. 40 years to mint a single Bitcoin. Has the universe ever known a scarcer element? Ethereum. Platform for finance, arts and culture. In July 2015, a group of developers led by Vitalik Buterin launched a new blockchain called Ethereum. Ethereum described itself as the world's programmable blockchain. It differentiated itself from Bitcoin by allowing anyone to build their own currencies and tokens. Ether, the currency used on the Ethereum network, can be thought of as digital oil compared to Bitcoin's digital gold. Ethereum allows its platform to be used to program and trade any digital and non-digital asset, that has a digital component. For example, the building that we occupy may not be digital, but one day its property deeds could be digital, allowing it to be traded on Ethereum's blockchain. Ethereum is winning the programmable blockchain race for three reasons. Number one, it has the best security guarantees as it is the most decentralized chain alongside Bitcoin. Number two, it has the largest developer community. Number three, it has the best liquidity. The largest and most valuable currencies, tokens and NFTs want to trade on Ethereum. NFT journalist William Pista described Ethereum as a community-run neutral public infrastructure for apps, media and money. Anatomy of an NFT. NFT stands for non-fungible token. Everyone understands the non and the token, but they struggle with fungible. An item is fungible if it can be replaced by another identical item. For example, money is fungible. If I give you £10 today, next week you can return any £10. It does not have to be that exact £10 I gave you. Non-fungible items cannot be interchanged. An airline ticket is a real-world example of a non-fungible item. It is very specific. Airline, destination, passenger, date and time. You cannot use it to travel anywhere in the world. As you look around you, you will notice that most objects in the world are actually non-fungible. The following slide describes the anatomy of a digital NFT. Often, you'll hear skeptics say, it's just a JPEG. However, an NFT consists of multiple components, including metadata, which can be any multimedia object, 
a unique token ID, address, a contract on a blockchain and a public transaction history. This allows its ownership to be easily verified and converts it to a tradable asset. The next slide shows where we are in the NFT journey. Currently, NFTs have disrupted the collectibles and digital art market. Gaming, brands, culture, metaverse, off-chain assets like property are all to come. Between now and 2030, NFTs will dominate all markets with predictions that even democratic procedures like elections will move on chain. What implications will this have for developing economies and new democracies? Let's get into the fun bit and start looking at some pictures. The crypto scene is powered by memes. Initially started to promote Bitcoin, many of the memes began poking fun at central bankers in their crazy money printing schemes. In the following slide, we see two memes. The first is from the Protestant Reformation by Martin Luther, a German peasant flatulating in the direction of the Pope. The second is a crypto meme poking fun at central bankers going insane with their money printing policies. Both pieces of art are launching direct attacks against the sacred symbols of the age. Crypto art has developed its own culture. Many art collections trade on similar themes. Derivative works are generally seen as a badge of honour rather than fake rip-offs. The two ape pieces on screen are by different artists. The cartoon figure being the original and the 3D rendition coming later as a derivative. Artists spot this trend and begin to create work with the intention of promoting reuse. For example, the four toad figures we see on screen are from a collection called Cryptodes by Gremlin. When launching this collection, Gremlin waived all copyright, encouraging other artists to copy and remix his work. Out of the four toads we see, only three are from the original Gremlin collection. The toad with a red background is from an identical collection, which was a direct copy. No issues or concerns were raised around copyright, as the artist knew that his original collection can always be verified via the blockchain. Could blockchains disrupt existing intellectual property laws in favour of on-chain verification? CryptoPunks For our first deep dive, we will look at CryptoPunks. This collection consists of 10,000 8-bit style unique avatars. The images have been digitally generated from a series of base images and trait layers. The project was released in 2017 and the cost of each punk was initially zero. You only had to pay the Ethereum transaction fees. They weren't the first NFTs, however, CryptoPunks hold historical value as they set the technical standards for future NFT contracts. The collection was inspired by the 70s British punk scene. Every avatar is unique, with some rarer than others. The complete set consists of 9 alien punks, 24 ape punks, 88 zombie punks, and the remaining split between male and female. The most expensive punk was sold for $11.7 million at Christie's. Why would anyone pay this much for an image that can easily be copied and replicated? Anyone can copy the image, but only the owner can transfer the ownership. The value of the NFT is derived from the fact that you own the transaction on the blockchain. With billions of people online, owning an expensive punk can be seen as the ultimate flex. Driving your Lamborghini around Mayfair may get you noticed by a couple of thousand people. Having a punk as your Twitter profile picture gets you noticed by millions. Ringers and generative art. Our second case study looks at a different type of project, but one equally valuable. Whilst CryptoPunks involved both computer-generated and human-generated art, 
Ringers belongs to a category of art that is wholly generated algorithmically. The Ringer series consists of a thousand generative art pieces, each unique and created using code. The piece you see, you see on screen was originally minted for a couple of hundred dollars. Ten months later, it sold for five million dollars. Not a bad trade for some lucky person. This may look like a simple piece. However, introduce a computer and suddenly there are an infinite number of ways to wrap a peg around a piece of string. Variations include sizing, layout, peg count, orientation and different colourful strokes. Computer generated art tends to delight and surprise in ways that humans can't imagine. The following quote from Dimitri, the creator of Ringers, gives us an insight into the process. Small bugs in code can create financial ruin. A bug in generative art can create unexpected levels of beauty. So throughout the process, I have observed those bugs and turned them into features of the art. NFT journalist William Pister described the importance of this category of art as follows. As the world grows increasingly digital and algorithmic, in the decades ahead, the cultural significance of generative art will surge. Why? People will cherish these works as some of the early information age's most expressive and exemplary art objects. Weird Wells and the Profile Picture Mania on April the 30th, 2021, Board Ape Yacht Club picked up where CryptoPunks left off and released 10,000 unique Ape Avatar NFTs, which also provided entry to a club membership. Initially, the membership had very limited utility, allowing members to scribe graffiti on an online bathroom wall. With an initial mint price of $200, the most expensive Ape sale to date, has been $3.4 million. Follow-on collections were launched, including dogs and mutant apes. The mutant ape drop raised $96 million in under 60 minutes, giving the Bored Apes team a staggering war chest to expand the brand further. The collection was a catalyst for the profile picture craze and prompted me to launch my own collection, Weird Wells, after speaking to some apes in Discord. Weird Wells and an, was an early profile picture collection. The, the, the development of the smart contract and image generation script was created with the help of another NFT collection that open sourced all their code. The collection consists of 3,350 wells mimicking CryptoPunks and coming in four formats. Normal, Zombie, Ape and Alien. The collection cost around $300 to build, largely in Ethereum transaction fees, and has traded around 1,800 ETH in volume, which is approximately around $8 million. 2021 has seen an explosion in OpenSea activity, the largest and original NFT marketplace. October 2021 sales were over $2 billion just for the month. Cultural adoption continues with companies like Visa purchasing a punk, celebrities joining the party and traditional auction houses like Sotheby's pricing art in ether alongside dollars, sterling and Swiss francs. The NFT art market is split into three categories. Number one. High-end crypto art that has very high value and low utility. These include pieces like crypto punks and ringers that outline the crypto renaissance. Buyers are prepared to pay very high prices to hold and display this art. Number two, potential billion dollar brands. Collections like board apes that have the potential to become the next Marvel or Star Wars. This could become a very interesting category if they can get royalties flowing back to the NFT holders from these franchises. No project has yet proved that this model works 
but any success here would be a conclusive rebuttal to its only a JPEG crowd. Number three, programmable art with high utility and low value, aimed at gamers. This includes in-game currencies, skins and cosmetics. Everything is still work in progress. Nothing guaranteed. The Metaverse. Neil Stevenson coined the term Metaverse in his 1992 novel Snow Crash. It referred to a 3D virtual world inhabited by avatars of real people. It has since been popularised in science fiction and most fascinatingly in the Steven Spielberg movie Ready Player One. Lately, the metaverse has been grabbing mainstream attention. Why now? Partly this is due to a convergence of technologies. AI and machine learning, virtual and augmented reality, Internet of Things and robotics, underpinned by crypto as the payment rails. Tyler Winklevoss of Gemini Exchange commented, Cryptocurrencies are the native currencies of machines and there are vastly more machines on Earth than humans. NFTs and expensive ape pictures may seem completely detached from this hyper-intelligent machine-dominated world. However, they are the key to securing this universe. In order to build the metaverse, a key infrastructure component is a registry of objects, a truth machine that protects our digital property rights. Gamers understand this better than anyone. Let's say I'm playing Fortnite. I spend a considerable sum of money acquiring some digital assets, in-game currency, skins, cosmetics. As soon as I lose interest in the game, I lose all my property. I cannot just disengage from the platform and take my assets with me. NFTs fix this by creating a decentralised layer that allows me to disengage freely from any digital service and take my property with me. Just like in the real world, we now have true digital property rights. Scale this out to every type of digital service and asset you can imagine and the enormous size of the opportunity becomes apparent. It's a mistake to think of the metaverse as just another platform. Investor and trader Raoul Powell described the size of the economic opportunity like the discovery of a solar system, this time in cyberspace. Tim Sweeney, CEO of Epic Games, described the importance of the metaverse as follows. This metaverse is going to be far more pervasive and powerful than anything else. If one central company gains control of this, they will become more powerful than any government and be a god on earth. Frightening and exciting at the same time. So, how do we prevent such a dystopian future which my generation will inherit? The solution is to go back to 2008 and pick up the white paper Satoshi Nakamoto left with us when he directed the world towards a more decentralised future.